architect and partner of the firm of Walker and Macy in Portland, Oregon. So that I don't foul things up and say wrong things about you, Doug, I think I will uh, stick to the notes that you sent me. And if you don't like what I say, you can blame your own press agent in the office. Uh, Doug is a registered landscape architect in the state of Oregon. He was educated at the University of Oregon, receiving a Bachelor of Landscape Architecture degree from that institution. Um, he has uh, been in practice for, I'm trying to add up here quickly, about 11, 13 years, uh, and has been uh, a partner in this current firm under several different names uh, since 1976. Doug serves the firm as the director of planning and has been principal in charge of numerous urban design, recreation planning, and public open space projects. He's had extensive experience in the coordination of multidiscipline consultant teams and in the conduct of public workshops and programming sessions for both private and public organizations. In addition to planning projects, Doug has had major involvement in the design and the programming of public and private recreational facilities, campus open space projects, governmental facilities, interpretive exhibits, and historic restoration, which pretty much covers the gamut of uh, a variety of, act of professional activities. The project that he brings to us tonight is a comprehensive interpretation and recreation plan for the Mount St. Helens area which was prepared for the U.S. Forest Service, uh, and their firm was in consultation with, I believe, two other firms, and I'll let Doug explain that association to you. Doug, we're pleased to have you with us at the College of Architecture and Planning this evening. Does that work? Can you hear me? Good evening. It's nice to be in Muncie. Uh, I wasn't so sure when I first arrived, uh, got off the plane and the uh, doors to the airport were locked. But eventually they let us in and we kind of we got it, found our way into town and then we I kept running into other locked doors. So I'm not sure what that means, but I've had uh, the chance to meet some students and had a nice dinner, so I, I am indeed happy to be here, finally. Um, as, been, as been said, I'm uh, going to speak tonight about the uh, Mount St. Helens Interpretive and Recreation Plan. Uh, had the good fortune to, over the last year, year and a half, to be involved in a study with, along with a uh, uh, local planning and research firm, David Dornbush and Company. They're primarily economists, and they do some other, other types of research. Uh, they're out of San Francisco and have a local office in Portland. Uh, along with, uh, uh, as well as Ken Beerley, who is an old friend of mine and a plant ecologist who's been involved in, in numerous uh, natural resource studies that, that we've been involved in. Uh, we put together a team that also included a number of uh, geologists, um, other people that had uh, specific knowledge about the, uh, the Mount St. Helens project or a potential project uh, as a result of their of their work with the USGS and, and others in the area. Um, so we, as a result of uh, uh, the, the three main firms and numerous other consultants, we we undertook a study that, that basically uh, its intent was to determine what the most effective way to, to essentially allow people to understand what happened, uh, what's happening in this current uh, episode of geologic activity, as well as to understand what has happened in the past and to, and to sense uh, that this, this uh, phenomenon is not necessarily a negative thing. It's a little scary at the time for all of us who are around there, but the fact is it's something that's, that uh, we're very fortunate to be able to see and what's the best way to, in a very positive way, in a very objective way, to uh, allow people to understand more about uh, what is going on there now. Uh, there tends to be an awful lot of emotionalism and a lot of 
I was in New York last week and I heard that uh, over the national news that, uh, the, that the mountain was going to blow up again and it was going to be every bit as bad as May 18th. Well, what that really means is that, that they're predicting um, probably some modest growth of the lava dome or something like that. Uh, so there's an awful lot of emotionalism around it and it's, uh, it, it's important that, it gets, that what's going on there is put into perspective uh, and people really do have a, an accurate, accurate understanding of what, uh, what an active uh, volcano is all about. We're very, again, we're very fortunate. In order to, uh, to go through this, I was fortunate when I was in, uh, in Cambridge last week to get a uh, film from uh, Bob Ross of the, of the United States Forest Service and I reviewed the film and I used it uh, as part of a, a talk I gave there. Um, what it will do is it will give you a sense of what happened uh, the, the actual eruption on May 18th and some of the activity before that time, what's, what happened as a result of that, the loss of life and kind of the more emotional sides of it. And also, it's, it's very interesting because you will see a, a very good uh, sequence of the actual eruption. Uh, what I'll be talking about after that will be more specifically what we're doing and what planning is going on uh, within the Forest Service to, to allow people, again, to have a, a clear understanding of what is what is going on. As well as um, one of the other things we'll be talking about a little bit, but not as much tonight, is, is that how do you introduce recreation back into an environment that uh, is a little uh, unpredictable. So I think uh, as, a, as a way of getting some background on the thing, I'll we'll go through this, uh, this film and then, uh, then we'll get into a few slides and hopefully we can get this all done in an hour, an hour and a half without putting, putting you to sleep. So if we could have the film. That uh, film was, uh, a good deal of that was Forest Service propaganda, but it, uh, I show it because it, uh, I think it's, it's a really good way to get a feeling for what went on. <clears throat> it's not nearly that exciting on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and that really has a lot to do with what interpreting is, because when you have an active volcano, it's no problem getting the people out, and it's no problem to, uh, to understand the forces and everything, but when it's dormant or when it's, when it's at least not active, uh, the, the job becomes a little more difficult. Um, so <clears throat> the slides that uh, I have are meant to illustrate some of the uh, uh, planning for the future uh, and call attention to the significant features that we have on the ground, the surface conditions, the form of the landscape that are the results primarily of May 18th and in some respect uh, of the, the geologic events that happened uh, before May 18th. Um, the, our task was to do an extensive resource inventory to determine what it was that was uh, interesting and would be interesting to the public and be the most way, useful way to, to interpret. So uh, the first thing we did was set about, uh, an interdisciplinary team of people set about mapping and, and doing field work to, to get a sense of what this is all about. Um, no question about the, the effect that this had on people's lives in the area, and again, that's something that's, it has to be recreated to some extent. I think it's important, however, to, uh, that, that in the interpretation that the emphasis on destruction and devastation and death and those kinds of, kinds of things are kept to a minimum because it, it really does uh, overshadow what I think is really a more, much more exciting story about the, the transfer, transformation of the Earth. Uh, but that's a tendency you see in, 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 uh, in all of the newsreels and that kind of thing, is to have it really sensationalized. Um, it's interesting the, uh, the effects that the, that the, ac the volcanic activity has had. There are kind of two people that come out of this. One kind of person can't get far enough away from it, and the other kind can't get, can't get too close. And there are people constantly going into the red zone, the, the restricted zone around the mountain, climbing the mountain, photographing down in the crater. Uh, being arrested and, and going back and doing it again. There's some people that are because kind of a cult of people that do this. Um, on the other hand, there are land developers and, and tourists and people like that, that uh, land developers who have dropped their options on land and, and are going to, back to California, which is fine with all of us. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, people that, that really would change their vacation plans because they're really basically afraid of the thing. So it has a tremendous uh, emotional effect. Um, you, you see, I mean, I've been on the, up on the viewpoint, various viewpoints many times, and, and you can't help but overhear various conversations about the spiritual significance of this, you know, and everybody has a slightly different story about what, what that is, but there is, certainly it has a, it has a, um, it's had a strong effect. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll go through the slides now and begin to show what we went through, the process we went through to specifically deal with the interpretive values, the interpretive features, and so I'll, what I'll do is, 
show you in more detail some of the results. And one thing the film doesn't cover very well are the definitive re results of of, uh, of the, the eruption and, and what those things, what, what that what that it left us with, and what now is beginning to transform. So we can have the slides. Was this thing where they, this thing figured out here? Okay. Just to give you a little orientation, um, the study area uh, it's shaded in the center there uh, is approximately 40 miles north and slightly east of Portland, which is in the lower left, um, and Seattle up above. It's surrounded by the, uh, it's in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, uh, Mount Rainier National Park is to the north, um, Mount Adams Wilderness Areas, uh, Goat Rocks Wilderness Areas to the east, Yakima, you can see off to the right of the map. That's where some of the film footage of the ash fall was taken. Um, Longview, Longview and Kelso to the west, uh, north being up. Um, the closest communities and most affected by the flooding and down, the down, downstream effects of the, of the actual May 18th eruption. This map was prepared as uh, one of the, uh, to show us the various options for visitors information centers that we proposed along the Interstate 5, which is the dark line diagrammatically running up and down. So the, the area is fairly remote. Uh, there are some very small communities right near it. There are three major reservoirs on the south uh, border of the mountain, fortunately, that were not affected by the uh, by the, the May 18th blast. This is a uh, infrared aerial photograph in the, of the area. Again, we're now coming in a little closer to the mountain to the lower right, a little little bit of steam coming out of it. The area that's uh, the, the dark or the, the brown area that extends to the uh, upper left, it shows the extent of the blast uh, standing dead timber approximately 18 miles away from the, from the mountain. Uh, you can begin to see that the major flooding, downstream flooding, uh, to the on the Toodle River, the south fork of the Toodle, the Toodle and the south fork of the Toodle, extending down to the uh, Columbia River, extensive flooding. The patchwork effect you see is clear cutting. This is this is an area between Weyerhaeuser and the United States Forest Service is is, is a major area of, of, of logging. Uh, it's considered a commodity forest is what they refer to it as. But some of the largest clear cuts that you could ever want to see or not want to see are in this area. I'm going to show this map briefly just to get started, then we'll come back to it at the end. But basically, this map describes the, the, the surface conditions. This, this was taken off of uh, from basic from field work, uh, but mainly off of aerial photographs and, and aerial mapping, extensive mapping that's been done by the United States government as, as a result of the importance of this, of this occurrence. And you have approximately, we have about, uh, let's see, 8, 10, or 12 um, features that uh, are results of May 18th, and then there's two or three significant features that can be seen easily uh, that were pre-1980. Um, so you begin to see the, uh, the different kinds of things. The red is the pyroclastic flow or pyroclastic debris, which is the hot ash and, and gases and rocks and debris moving very rapidly down the mountain. Um, the light brown is, uh, use this implement here, light brown is uh, debris, debris flow. And downstream from that is uh, mud flow, or essentially flooding, moving out from the, all sides of the mountain. The gray are areas that are just essentially completely bare. Uh, the timber has been completely removed from them. Uh, some of those are, in fact, clear cuts, but most of it is, is, was an effect. This is, this is uh, just all rock here on the mountain, but all this, these areas in close here where the vegetation was completely eliminated. And you have the, the brown, the light brown here, which is um, standing uh, down timber, and the orange perimeter around here, which is actually, one, I think, one of the more interesting features, that is uh, standing dead timber. The blue are lakes, and again, the lakes I'll talk about a little later, they are substantially changed. Spirit Lake is the large lake in the center here. It's at 200 feet elevation higher than it used to be. Uh, there are several new lakes that have been created by the, by the flooding and the debris in the area. So what I'm going to do now is go through each one of these uh, uh, several exam slight examples of, of what there is there today. And, uh, and then I'll go into a little bit how we evaluated the, that and how we arrived at an interpretive plan, land use plan, and the, the basis of it. The mountaintop and the crater itself are two of the, two of the um, very important features. The mountaintop, you can, because it can be seen for, for, for so far, just a distance away, and it's, it can be appreciated by a lot of people, the fact that it was a very uniform conical mountain before and now it has a substantially different configuration becomes one of the major interpretive features. 
So anytime you can see the mountaintop and see that, that in the crater's rim and everything, that's, we feel is a very important um, uh, interpretive feature. That's looking up the two. This is now looking down into the, to the crater. Early on, this is when the lava dome was just a little button in the bottom of it. The shadow that's being cast across, it's coming off of a, that notch up there is where there was a glacier. And when the mountain blew up, the glacier slid, melted down the south side, causing some of the south, the minimal south side damage. But it, it's always, every time we've flown over it, it always pr provides an interesting shadow pattern. There it is again. Again, you can see on the south sides the evidence of the pre-1980 lava flows. Which there hasn't been any lava flows in the recent, recent activities, but that, that's one of the nice things about the south side. It has a very distinctly different uh, interpretive value. This shows an ash storm. You can see how the ash is tumbling and rolling off the ridges. Um, this day we couldn't get down in very close because of the ash. Now this is down inside the crater. Now you can see that the, well this is later on when the lava dome was actually much larger. The lava dome now is about 600 feet high. Uh, it's, it's quite large and it's uh, this, apparently this uh, prediction for more activity is that it's, it's going to be more, more dome building activity as predicted in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> There are areas from the ground that you can see up into the crater and see the lava dome. Most of these shots I'm showing you are from a helicopter. And in this shot you can see, a, if you look closely here, a USGS research team on the ground down there. It's a helicopter. This is an example of one of the viewpoints that we've identified and, and actually recommended as a, as a future point of, for an interpretive uh, at least, at least a viewpoint, not a, not a facility, that you can get right in and look right up into the, to the, uh, the crater itself. And, and from this site, you can also see quite a number of other significant features. This, it's a little deceiving. The, the fact that the landscape is bare here has nothing to do with it. It wasn't blown away here. That was a clear cut. It is all covered with ash, however. Pyroclastic flows and pyroclastic debris, again, is all the material that moved down out of the mountain, down on, into Spirit Lake and filled Spirit Lake. And it's a very distinctive landscape, has its very distinctive forms. Um, it's an area that uh, differs greatly from anything else. It's uh, very, very dramatic. Uh, it's very um, unstable, and it's, uh, will be a, it'll take a long time for this to revegetate, or longer for this to revegetate than it will some of the other uh, areas around the mountain. <coughs> this is the, right near the Spirit Lake Basin, just on the north side of the mountain. You can see all the trees on the surrounding hills. Uh, that was the was the Mount Margaret Wilderness area, which is one of the most popular hiking areas in the Northwest, is completely void of vegetation. Just looking down at the right at the base of the, of the pyroclastic flow, those are little craters down there, and they call secondary vent craters. Everybody thought that when they were steaming several days and weeks after the after the eruption, that there was a new volcano being created there. But essentially, what it was is just hot gases and, and uh, chunks of ice and, and just material that had been buried in the avalanche that was just venting out and it eventually stopped. <coughs> this is a picture of the same, same area um, during the winter. Again, Mount, the, uh, the lakes of Spirit Lake is the next, the la this lake and other lakes are another one of the major features to look at. The thing that's interesting about Spirit Lake again is that the elevation is 200 feet higher and the shoreline is in, in the bottom configuration of the lake is substantially different than it used to be much larger in volume, but not as deep. <coughs> a lot of logs out there. Mm -hmm. It really smells, too. It's, something. It's, it's like a reservoir. I mean, the shoreline, isn't, the shoreline doesn't have any vegetation, and it's, uh, it looks like a recently uh, filled reservoir. And one of the first things that the, the people that went in there noticed was they, could, they couldn't find Harmony Falls, which is a 200-foot uh, high falls, and the reason they couldn't find it is it was no longer there. It was underwater. It took a while, though, when you first went in there to know, understand where they were. I think that was some of that dialogue in the, uh, in the film. Again, that shows the shoreline conditions. And the, and the trees in this area, these were all wooded, completely wooded slopes here, and they're just, the trees have just essentially been eliminated from these steeper slopes. This lake down to the lower right, down below here, is Clearwater, or Coldwater Lake, which is one of the lakes formed by the debris flow that went down the Tudor River. Uh, the, the dam, uh, the Tudor, uh, runs back this way, and then down here was the dam was formed. This was just a relatively 
a medium-sized creek that came down out of this out of this canyon. Not a major drainage at all, but now it's a lake that's over a mile long. And the Corps of Engineers has had to have had to um, I don't know if they had to, but they did um, build a uh, release channel out of it just in case it might uh, the dam itself might break. They, they trust their own dams more than they do natural ones, I guess. I don't know what the, the realities of that are. But nevertheless, they spent several million dollars putting a canal out of it. But that's one of the really interesting features. This is there are several other smaller ones, but Coldwater Lake is now a major lake in the area that didn't exist at all before. I'll show more shots of that. Well, this is down at the basin. You begin to see all the this is debris uh, that moved down the down the Tootle uh, out of the Spirit Lake Basin uh, that that created the dam. This is before they put the canal in. This is looking back at it again. This is all. <clears throat> all debris, the mountains back this way. This is all debris that moved approximately four miles down from the Spirit Lake Basin area. This thing you see here is really also very interesting, and I don't have a slide showing the other side of it, but what happened was when the material was blown out of the mountain, it, it actually sloshed up over the top of Coldwater Ridge, and this is the drain out of that here. And it was quite an amazing uh, uh, amount of material to be sloshed around in the hillsides. <clears throat> very deep cut. This is this, this is the next bunch of slides on standing dead timber. One of the one of the resources I think will have some long long lasting value. Uh, you begin to see the, the standing dead timber here was not knocked down with the blast, but it was it was killed. In fact, it didn't turn color for several days after or weeks after the after May 18th. But you begin to sense from this point the the the, the force and the, the power of the of that particular um, event. And as the live trees get larger and Assuming you don't go in and just clear these out and leave some spires and uh, leave these, some of these trees in here, you'll have over a long period of time a very, very graphic edge of, of the, the extent of the, the blast. In some cases, this is uh, 16, 17 miles out from the mountain where you can't even see the mountain. You, uh, this particular case is at uh, <clears throat> Upper Clearwater Canyon, which is also the site of the heaviest tephra deposit, um, airborne material, uh, pumice and ash. Um, that was deposited in this area. It's very, it's a very area that's very um, much interest to the biologist and for, for research on revegetation. It's also a very good view of the mountain. So what we were looking for are combinations, points that you could go into and you could see a combination of these features all at one place. This is a close-ups of some of the dead, standing dead and down timber. We're getting into both now. You can, just for scale, you can, this is in a camp line. You can see the restroom there that lost it. I pulled the wrong slide out. I had another slide showing a, more of that. But again, this is right on the edge. You can see the ash in the trees. And right at the edge, we uh, were completely unharmed. So there's quite a number of pockets of vegetation like this throughout the area that <coughs> well, it's already coming back very nicely. Example of some downed trees with ash cake on them. It's like asphalt. This is Ryan Lake, 13 miles away from the from Mount St. Helens, which was a campground and, and it, an area where people did that uh, you, that uh, backpacked and uh, and did horse packing uh, would would bring their trailers. This was kind of the end of the line. This is back in that area in the upper upper uh, Clearwater where the there's a tremendous interest in, the, in research of this area because of the, the heavy tephra deposit. You can begin to see how it was so deep in this area that it begins to, it's hard to even see the road edges. It's really uh, 18, 20 inches deep in this, in this area. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting area to us because it has, uh, does, you can see quite a number of the actual features uh, from one spot, and you're also in an area that's fairly accessible and doesn't require new roads. I mean, we, what we drove in on these roads and they hadn't been improved at all, or they hadn't, didn't have to be plowed out. So the roads were attacked. There was very little impact in that, in that regard in this area. The people will be able to get back into that area right away. This is de the debris flow, which again created the new lakes. This is downstream, looking, <coughs> looking down to the, the flooded area. The debris flow is extended about four miles, four miles out from the mountain itself. Large chunks of material. It's hard to get a sense of scale. But house size lumps there. Now you begin to, re to look at how large those, those lumps are compared to the tree. The trees there are second growth fir, probably 40, 50 feet tall. The new channel, the Tudor River, has moved over to the side in this case. The green tinge on this is the Soil Conservation Service spent a lot of money trying to stabilize this. Um, it was kind of an experiment. 
I'm not sure what it proved, but it, it gives it kind of a funny green tan. This, look, this is looking from the, uh, the pyroclastic flow area down to the debris flow. You begin to see the difference in textures. Um, and those are very evident from any given viewpoint. So you can imagine yourself up on one of these hills, and you look down on some of these patterns. They're uh, very, very distinct. Distinct, uh, and, and some of these will have uh, will have some have long term. Maybe the next 15, 20 years will be will be still be graphic enough that you could uh, the story can be told. Just looking back upstream over the debris flow, back to the mountain. Now we're getting into floods. Mud flows and floods downstream. And the furthest reaching, other than the ash, this is the furthest reaching uh, effect of the mountain. This is on the south side. Most of the flooding on, and, and uh, mud flows over here were a result of the glaciers melting off the top uh, and uh, some of the streams that drain out to the south. But tremendous amount of movement in this area. This is out in the cave basalts area, which um, I'll get into in a minute. Uh, there's some of the longest lava tubes in the country not the world are here. There's a lava tube here two miles long, and the area was already popular as a geologic area because of the, the lava flows, um, recent lava flows in the area. And some of these mud flows have, been, have, have threatened the entrances to those caves, and in some cases flooded some of the caves. This moves off through the trees. This is downstream towards um, about 15 miles, 20 miles downstream. You know. Fantastic patterns. These braided, uh, these braided streams. Uh, these these river bottoms are really interesting in terms of how they how they are now having to rebuild themselves. There's a quite an interesting uh, article in National Geographic you may have seen some months back that that talks about this. These are some of the lava flows, the pre-1980 uh, features that are quite visible and, of, of, I think, uh, general um, interpretive value. <coughs> Again, the nice, the significant thing about it is there was no, everybody was cheering for lava. They wanted the thing to have, you know, they wanted to see lava. Everybody associated lava with a volcano, and this is an explosive volcano, not when the, in this, in this episode is not producing that lava flow. But these are the cave basalts, which are really quite interesting, and the lava caves that have for years attracted a lot of people. Begin to see the patterns. They're all covered with ash in this photograph, but those are those patterns are essentially created by the lava flows. This is a this is a little bit of recent mud flow in here. Hmm. Okay, so back to the map. Um, the, first, the first step in our analysis was to, to map all these features that we've just seen. First, identify them and, and refine them from the aerial photographs and maps, and begin to, to understand um, what, which of these features had, had value for interpretation. And so, based on this map, we, we, then, we then had to go through and look at the topography of the area, which essentially gave us a, the, a framework so we could, we could tell um, you know, from what point could you see what. And uh, since we had the, the features, approximately 10 major features identified, and these are just the ones that you can see visually, pardon me, visually uh, in the open, the out, in the, out through the open space, there are an awful lot of other things that are much more uh, refined and detailed that we can't deal with at this scale. But by first identifying the, the surface features, um, which are quite different than anything we've ever done as far as visual resource analysis, and then looking at the topography, and the darker being the lower low elevations and the lighter being the higher elevations. This was all done manually. Um, we were able to develop a this plate here, and I'm skipping over some of the fine parts, but can't get that to focus. Anyway, this is a what we call visual access of, vol of volcanic conditions conditions, and it's a fairly complex uh, grouping. But if from anyone from what, what we're trying to do is determine from any given point on the ground what can you see and, and based on after this step, we then have, we put a, uh, assigned a value to the various features that we've just gone through. Um, a, a value of uh, five being a um, we had a great argument over this. And we changed, actually we went through several several cuts and had a lot of discussion about what was more valuable and what. But it was based on what we felt uh, the public, the general public, would 
would respond to in terms of an edu from an educational standpoint. So each one of the volcanic features that we that were on the last plate were given assigned a value, and based on <coughs> on uh, what you how many of them you can see from any given given point, we came up with a what we call a volcanic associations map. This gave us the basis for siting roads, determining where the best place for viewpoints were, recreation sites, as it relates to um, allow, if the, if the objective is to allow people to have the greatest understanding of what, what has gone on. So what our objective was is to look for those areas that, that, that allowed the person to understand to the greatest extent uh, all the different effects of, of the, the kind of eruption that happened on May 18th. Um, <clears throat> this was refined several times before we, between us and the client, we, uh, we agreed on it. But it gave, us the, it gave us the basis to go into our planning options and the development of an interpretive system for the area. I think I don't think I mentioned, but the area is a 200, about 240 square miles that was affected by the May 18th uh, eruption, and we were dealing in this case with more like 300, 325 square miles for the planning study, which extended beyond the, the area that was affected. One of the things that was going on at the same time as we were doing this, this work was the uh, a, a very large planning team, the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, was looking at all kinds of other issues. Uh, in some respects, more important issues of land use and what to allocate, what land should be allocated for interpretation and what should be logged and what should be left for wildlife habitat. And this, this whole thing somewhat interrupted their ongoing land management process and land management studies. And so they had to kind of go back to the, back to the boards. The area in red was the designated, at that time, it was designated as an interpretive area, which is very much like a wilderness area, except its emphasis is slightly towards education and, and research. Uh, we felt that they had done fairly well in terms, based on our research, had done fairly well in terms of protecting and including all the significant areas, um, at least major portions of all those significant features within the interpretive zone. So we had very little argument with it, with the exception of the, of the circles you see up there. And the three circles in the center to the right are, of course, in the area where I showed slides of the uh, standing dead timber and the heavy tepper deposit and also a place where you can see the mountain. At the same time, the researchers felt this was an important area to keep the log trucks out of. So uh, ultimately, they did make some changes in the boundaries in that area and included the entire upper, upper section of the, of the clear, uh, clear water drainage uh, in the interpretive zone, so it will be protected. And so that was one area where we had a direct influence on the land use plan that was underway. A large circle um, here on the south side of the mountain was essentially all the cave basalts and the areas that in the past had been logged and, and, uh, and heavy use, winter and summer recreation use, and roads everywhere. We felt that now that there's a major, there's a major designation to the, uh, that's based on the, uh, the current geologic activity, they're really, out, really included the past geologic um, areas in, in, the, in the area and manage the whole thing as a, as a comprehensive uh, unit rather than just concentrating on the, on the areas that were affected recently. The other area that we had some influence on, in fact, they did include more of that area. It was one of the, the slides I showed where you could, we're quite a ways away and looking across the flat and you can see right up into the crater. Um, that site also is a, is a location of several small lakes a lot of uh, relatively flat land, generally, generally sloping land, so it is very suitable for viewpoints and some maybe day use and overnight uh, uh, development, assuming a dormant, a dormant condition. So that was also, portions of that were included in the interpretive zone for more protection, but it was on, right on the edge of the interpretive zone, so we could get auto access to that area. So that's how we affected the overall land use plan. The, one of our tasks was to come up with the entire format for interpretation, and so I'll quickly go through this. Uh, or we, were, we were asked to find a location for a major visitor center in the forest somewhere, and, and what we did is we determined that the best thing to do was to not put it in the forest at all, but put it out on the Interstate 5, because you have a captive, captive audience out there. And that was, a, that was accepted by the, by the Forest Service as a pretty good idea, because if you get more people, you probably afford to build something a little nicer. So the idea is to build a major visitor's information center with uh, very um, engaging interpretive exhibits, uh, film, IMAX, possibly IMAX quality film. Um, other ideas uh, like having a uh, the remote video of uh, some of the remote cameras that they have set up in the, in the red zone in the crater can be, could be uh, operated by people in the visitor center at the freeway and really allow a lot of people to, to experience what happened, what's going on up there without having to go up there. Because a lot of people frankly don't like to do that. They don't want to, they don't have the time, and they don't want to take the trip of 40, 80 miles round trip. And so, for those who do want to go, however, that becomes the first stop in an, in an educational process that allows them to know more about it. So from there, out from there, you have portal facilities, and essentially they are 
uh, interpreting facilities in the, in the forest, in and around the various areas that are, have, have uh, local um, resources that are of interest. And they're also kind of a control point uh, during the uh, time when you have to be careful about letting people in. And out from that, you have environmental education centers, which are essentially geared towards institutions all the way from outdoor school at the, at the elementary level all the way up through college. Uh, eventually, campgrounds, day use, more traditional recreation facilities, uh, roads, trails, and viewpoints off of roads and trails. So that's, that makes up the entire system. Right. This next slide simply describes a little more in detail the, the visitor center, which we've suggested, again, besides being on the freeway, would also be in conjunction with the United, U.S. Geological Survey, who are looking for a site for a research facility. Thought it'd be good to put the two together in order to have, um, so the public could have access in a controlled manner to what's going on with the USGS, the archives, the the, uh, the resources of the people that are there, uh, the comings and goings of the equipment, the helicopters and all that, which I think the, the public kind of likes. So that was the, the recommendation with the visitor center. Because of the uh, unknown quantity of the mountain and its unpredictable uh, nature, uh, we had to do two scenarios for planning. One would be what we call um, intermittency, which is uh, um, planning alternatives for the time and, uh, when the mountain is still active or it's in an inter intermittent stage of activity. And then we had a series of planning alternatives, assuming dormancy, if anybody would, would like to proclaim dormancy, which nobody seems to be stepping forward to do. So um, the first go around was short-term intermittency, which deals with the time which all the logs are coming out of the forest. There's so many log trucks coming down the roads now that we really had to be careful where we put people in. So basically what you're seeing here is that the red, uh, solid red lines are, are auto access. The dotted red lines would be limited auto access or controlled access, two viewpoints of various kinds, some right on the periphery of the red, what we call the red zone, some just inside the red zone, the restricted zone, and others on, on high ridges far away. Um, Long-term intermittency, again, you begin to see more roads, more access. All of these, all the roads and access and viewpoints are outside of the, the designated interpretive area, they, but they do come right up to the edge of it. Um, for discussion purposes, we showed alternatives in the, in the dormancy and long-term of putting a road back into Spirit Lake. And the, uh, no one was very pleased about that, but we did it as a, as a way of getting discussion, and we certainly got a lot of discussion on it. We also put roads in areas that had been previously designated for wilderness, um, and it was a good way to get the planning team with the Forest Service to, to really make clear what their, what their intentions were. But we went through a lot of a number of exercises. These maps here are not the final maps, they're the interim maps that we, that we prepared for discussion purposes. And ultimately, our, recommend, our recommendation was to go with the, 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 cent, the central, the middle level of active, uh, development and the dormant scenario. Um, we had a maximum development and a minimum development, each with a, a different extent of, of, um, of facilities. And primarily what you're seeing here, the green is, uh, is off-road, access only trails, access through significant areas inside the, um, down through the Spirit Lake Basin. The design and laid out to allow the, a person in the area to, to experience the mac, a maximum number of, of features and, and unique environments. The um, environmental education centers in the area for, for academic use, day use areas, campgrounds, portal facilities again would remain uh, kind of on-site visitors centers that would have uh, interpreting programs at them. Um, essentially a combination of both, both traditional recreation resources and, uh, and a system that's geared specifically for interpretation. That is that. Are there any questions? Land management? Well, the Forest Services have an ongoing land use and land management planning system going, and they were just about ready to, to conclude their their land management plan for the for these various uh, ranger districts in this area. And as a result of this, they obviously had to start all over again, and they've really taken a second look at it. So the, 
the, the emphasis has completely changed in the area. And they've gone back uh, and started all over again in terms of their, their entire emphasis. There's a lot of battles still go on within the Forest Service in terms of how many logs should come out, how much land should be designated what they call general forest, which means it can be logged, how much land should be designated for more exclusive research uses, interpretive uses, recreation uses. So essentially they've started all over again. This study was a part of several other studies uh, designed to look specifically at those values that would, uh, would, would be uh, uh, geared towards interpretation in a general sense. There are also a lot of efforts on research, specific research on wildlife, um, um, aquatic wildlife, um, vegetation regrowth. And th those things are ongoing efforts that are still affecting the planning. So there's much more there's a much more intense look at the land at land use and land use policies in the area than there ever was. Well, it's such a unique thing. I don't know. I don't know that I can, I can answer. I don't know whether it has or not. But the, the I, there are er there are no other areas that I know of that are experiencing something like this. And so, uh, well, I think there's an, uh, the National Park Service has been in, in doing interpretive work for longer than the Forest Service. The Forest Service ha happens to be strapped with this, and they they're glad to have it. And in fact, I think they're doing a pretty good job. But uh, they, they have had to take a real close look at how do you do, interp how do you provide uh, interpretive resource, uh, interpretive systems. National Park Service has done that a lot longer than, than the Forest Service has. So it definitely has had an effect on the National Forest Service in terms of the quality. First, they're allocating, um, as far as dollars are concerned, a lot more money per square foot for a building, a lot more money for roads. Uh, they're, they're basically have upped their standards in terms of uh, what, they're, what they normally would do in, in providing for, for, for visitors. So it has had that effect. I don't know whether it's had. Uh, I think there's generally a trend in, in uh, uh, well, there wasn't before the uh, the bottom fell out of the economy, I guess, uh, towards uh, more education as part of recreation. And more people are, are more curious. They want to. They don't want to just simply go out and see the pretty sights. They want to understand that. They want to get. They want to have some more, some greater understanding of what's going on. I think that's a trend generally. It, it costs money, but it's. Uh, I think the public will demand it. And, and eventually we're going to see a lot more of it. Yes? I didn't, sorry, I didn't hear you. In the, in the periphery? The, the, uh, the areas that we, we went, I didn't present any of the criteria for how we established recreation sites, but basically we went through a different, a different set of, of um, uh, studies to determine what areas we felt should be designated as recreation. And we, we, those areas were outside the interpretive area, they were on established roads, and they didn't interfere with existing or proposed wildlife areas or natural botanical areas. And the idea is that you have, you have a tremendous pressure, there are people that are crawling all over themselves to get up to the area. So what we were trying to do is establish a, a reasonable level of activity without introducing too many or encouraging too many people into the area. And in no case did we put or propose recreation facilities in any of the areas that were affected by the, uh, by the May 18th eruption. And they were in most cases well outside of the, of the immediate area. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are, view, those are viewpoints only. There was a limited access viewpoints, either accessed by, by uh, trail or road, or limited road access, but no permanent installations there. Again, one of the things we indicated to the Forest Service, we felt they should not invest major resources in there. They should not try to attract too many people in there. That they should do that back at the freeway. Take the pressure off back at the freeway, and then take the pressure off back away. All of our portal facilities are on-site interpreting facilities and well outside of the areas that have any significance. The only time that we felt was important to maybe introduce the public in, in, a, in a short of uh, in, in automobiles or tour buses, was in certain significant areas where you can get a number of people in in a controlled way and get them back out without providing huge parking lots at the end of the road so they can all walk down the hill. Um, and that's a management issue which we recommended that they manage that as, as limited or controlled access rather than just opening it up to as many people as can get in. Now that's up to them now to, to do that. But that was the way we, we treated it.
was to try to take a cautious approach to that. Some may say it's not cautious enough. Yes. <clears throat> there are a number of things that the, the Soil Conservation Service seeded the uh, debris flow, which didn't have too much effect, and then the, the, the seed didn't take too well on some of the side slopes, but it took very well down on the, on the bottom of the tutel. Um, there's a lot of experimental planting going back in. Mainly, the effort for flood control right now, they're just trying to head off any major disaster downstream by dealing with channel uh, modification, opening up the channel and uh, creating uh, dams to absorb the, the, uh, the flow. And I'm not sure exactly what is currently going on as far as revegetation, other than I know there's a lot of different efforts, most of them experimental, to, uh, to revegetate. All the areas that have been logged uh, the salvage logging has gone on in are being revegetated. They found that those areas revegetate very nicely as far as putting putting back uh, uh, forest product, forest trees. So that's that's going on, and they're going back into all the areas they've they've salvaged and and uh, and re uh, replanted trees. I'm not really familiar with all of the efforts that are going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the mountain had a real checkerboard of ownership. Uh, Burlington Northern Railway, Railway owned the top, and I'm not sure what, whether they want to claim it now or not, because it's scattered all over the United States, but <coughs> it's probably be sued or something. But uh, then private uh, holdings, uh, state land, state forest land, um, private timber land was all checkerboarded. Again, especially in there on the south, the south side where we had, where we designated an area, we thought that they ought to consolidate all that and manage that as an interpretive zone. A good, but what the, the implications of that would be that they'd have to buy that land. Also all along the western border of the uh, forest between the U.S. Forest Service and the Weyerhaeuser land, we suggested that they purchase that. Uh, our suggestion was, was, was redundant really because it was already underway. Um, <clears throat> they hope to, I think, uh, to, and that's something they're very quiet about as far as land, land purchase and exchange, but they, ex they hope to exchange land with, with warehouses and other timber companies and then buy out the state's holdings and, and consolidate all that into national forest land and manage it all as national forest. That'll take some time, but that is, that's, they're, they're going at that very aggressively. Yes? The, um, the roads that were in place in, in the area are being rebuilt, some of them, uh, uh, to, to allow for the salvage logging. The roads that were inside of the area that's now designated as the, as the interpretive zone will not be rebuilt. They will be left and they will intact where they are right now. So you're going to have in the long run a lot of road areas that uh, could quite possibly be used as trails. Um, they won't be rebuilt as roads. The, there are a number of um, pieces of equipment, large pieces of uh, logging equipment and cars that will be, that are in significant areas. I'm not a real fan of all that, but uh, the fact is it does show the force and does show, it's a, it's a good example of how, how, much, how much force there was at that time. So I think it's, to see a, a major piece of, you know, a big caterpillar type piece of equipment just twisted is, is fairly impressive, I guess. And there are several of those that the Forest Service has, has uh, they, they bought them from the uh, insurance companies and they built chain link fences around them. I don't know why, there's nobody in the area, but so <clears throat> their intention is to use those as interpretive features. And I, I reluctantly go along with that, I guess. Any other questions? Sure. A couple of other announcements before we finish up this evening. Um, Doug has very graciously given us uh, a couple of days of his time on his travels back from some business and meetings that he has been attending on the East Coast back to his own office. He'll be here tomorrow morning in North Quad, uh, and I would particularly encourage the fifth year students and the third year graduates who are hopefully finishing up this spring and are anticipating uh, work, perhaps particularly in the private sector, to talk with Doug, not in terms of encouraging them all to interview for a job, but I'm sure with uh, Doug's many years of experience uh, as a partner in an office that he has certain 
insights and perceptions pertaining to this type of practice that he would be happy to share with you. Tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock in 104B, he will be, uh, we have scheduled a second presentation which will focus on some of the urban design work that their office has been conducting, specifically Pioneer Square, which is a major urban square either adjacent to or on uh, the, the transit mall areas in right in the downtown section of Portland. We have scheduled this for the Landscape Architecture Studios, but I would invite anyone else who is interested to attend, if need be, in space uh, uh, available. If we can't all fit into 104B, perhaps we can can expand back into this room. That will be tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and I encourage you to join us for the gathering.